Hello, everyone. So my name is Ji. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So uh, I'm currently a tech lead at Mesosphere right now. I'm an Apache Mesos PMC and a committer since 2013. Uh, so I'm mainly responsible for like uh, uh, containerization, networking, storage uh, stuff inside Mesos. Um, yeah, I've been maintaining the containerization part for quite a long time. Uh, I used to work at Twitter. Uh, I was a software engineer there, and I gained my PhD from university. University of Michigan um, in 2013. All right, so um, this is the outline of my talk. So I'm going to give you a kind of very brief overview. How many of you are using Mesos right now in, in production? OK, cool. So I probably skipped some of the part because I made this slides for a, a like open source summit and uh, some introduction on Mesos part. I can skip those. Uh, and then I'm going to give you some overview of like history of containerization in Mesos. And then uh, I'm going to talk about how we adopt those uh, new container standards. Uh, and then I'm going to highlight some of the new features we recently added into um, Mesos, uh, and then talk about the future roadmap, what we are heading to. Um, so Mesos is a kernel for data center applications. Uh, uh, if you think about what a traditional code OS kernel does uh, for resource management, uh, the, the, the traditional operating system like Linux abstract away those uh, CPU, host CPU and memory, those hardwares, and providing some programming abstractions to the, uh, the user applications. Uh, those abstraction like things we are very familiar with, like process, threads, file, things like this. And then the way Linux kernel provides security and isolation for those um, programs is through like things like virtual memory, users, all these concepts inside Linux kernel or other operating system kernel. Um, so what Mesos does, if we think about Mesos as a like data center kernel or distributed, center distributed system kernel, and uh, uh, it does the same thing as Linux kernel uh, regarding, like, for example, resource management part, it manages not just single CPU or memory, it manages like, uh, all the uh, CPU and memory in a cluster. And it provides some programming abstraction to, uh, to uh, developers. This is the Mesos API uh, you're very familiar with, like task, offers, resources. And uh, it also provides security and isolation for those applications on top. Um, this is through containerization. That's my focus of the talk today. So uh, I'm going to probably skip those simple things um, that this is a typical Mesos workflow. Um, um, I, I'll jump into like the history of containerization uh, in Mesos. So what is container? So I think I feel that the container, the, the word of container being overloaded um, quite a bit, and from different person, the perspective from different person have different interpretation of container. For example, for developers, if you are talking about a container, they are probably talking about their quite creating container images. And if you're talking to an operator, uh, when they talk, talk about containers, um, they probably think container is like an isolated execution environment. So uh, actually, the containerization in Mesos focus on the latter, which is uh, from operator side. Uh, we focus on creating a um, isolated execution environment for your applications. And it starts very uh, early. It starts from the very beginning. So I think um, that's like 0 0.10, 2000. 11, uh, we, uh, the first like, very early version of Mesos has this process-based um, containerization. So basically, agent launch a bunch of processes on, on, on the host, uh, and each container is actually a process session. And there is no resource isolation at all. It's basically a bunch of Linux processes uh, on the box. Um, and then. Um, in 2012, uh, I think things the, 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 the problem with the previous solution is you don't have resource isolation. So one container can just use up all the resources on the host. So um, then we noticed that, hey, we have this Linux C group support, which is very nice, give you ability to uh, restrict the CPU and the memory uh, for a given group of tasks, group of processes. So we introduced this uh, Linux C group direct support. Uh, and then at a, at a time, we only enable like, CPU and the memory isolation because these are the two um, main resources that people are using. And then we also use um, the Freezer C group for um, process management because uh, like C group gives you the ability to, um, to track all the processes in a container very easily compared to using processes, process trees, which is not very reliable because you have this reparent thing. 
Um, so we use Freezer Secret for process management. Also, that I think the Freezer also simplify uh, one part, which is like uh, when, you, when, you, when you try to kill the container, you want to make sure that uh, you stop all the, all the processes in that C group first, and then you send six, six, six kill to all these processes, and then you um, unfreeze the C group so that those signals will be delivered. The nice thing about that is you don't have the race condition because you have to scan all the pits first and then do sick kill. But at the same time, if some process is still running, that process might exit, and you might send a sick kill to a, a, a wrong process. So the freezer C group solve that issue by just allowing all the allowing us to freeze the entire C group so that we can deliver the kill signal atomically. All right, so that's 2012, 010. Um, and then uh, in 2014, I think that C group stuff has been in production at Twitter for a long time. And then in 2014, we start to add more and more uh, like C group support like because there are more and more subsystems being introduced inside the Linux kernel, and we want to add those support. And we realized that the old architecture uh, uh, does not scale anymore. So we, we kind of didn't refactor in 018 to uh, introduce this concept called containerizer. Uh, it uses a pluggable architecture. You can specify on uh, different isolators and the launchers. So we, we like these are the two main abstractions that we provide inside Mesos um, containerization code. Um, so the isolators you can think of isolator is like lifecycle hooks. So during the container like like. Like before container start, after container terminates, or during the, uh, like say when there's a task being sent to the container, we provide those hooks allow you to inject arbitrary code to do isolations. And then we actually made those CPU memory C group isol um, isolation being part of an isolator, and then we introduce more and more isolators to make it more modular. And also, um, there's another concept called launcher. Launcher is mainly responsible for uh, process management, like how many processes are there, and how do you kill a bunch of processes? How do you um, launch a process, a launcher container. So we have three major launchers right now, Linux, Postgres, and Windows. So Linux launcher basically just using standard Linux features like C group namespaces. Um, Postgres launcher uh, basically does nothing, just do fork exec, basically. And Windows is using job objects to, to, to create containers and processes on Windows. So that's 2014-018, Mesos 018. Um, so there's a, a bunch of isolator we add later. Uh, like you, if you go to this, I, I, I recently cleaned up the documentation. So um, if you go to this um, latest documentation for Mesos Containerizer, you can see a full list of um, documentation for each individual isolators. Um, there's some special ones. I think we add most of the C group subsystem support through isolation. And we have some disk isolators, file isolators, some namespaces isolators. Um, and networking and volumes. Uh, I don't. I don't want to jump into details. Um, I want to continue this kind of history of containerization. I think 2014, the same year in in the next two, like in 020, uh, Docker is really popular at the time. 2014, and uh, uh, so so therefore we add a new containerizer um, to to Mesos called Docker Containerizer, which is essentially launching container not using Mesos, like you're not using the the Mesos part of the code, but using just using Docker sh daemon by just shelling out to Docker daemon, and you just shout just do Docker run, Docker pull, Docker stop, Docker rm, things like this, and then these two containerizer can actually coexist on the same agent. So you can, you can definitely have some container running using Docker, and some container using Mesos Containerizer. Uh, so that's 2014. Now, uh, in 2016, last year, uh, 028, we start to support um, um, Docker using Mesos Containerizer. The reason we wanted to do that is we realized that uh, what Docker does essentially are using a bunch of Linux primitives, which we already have support for in Mesos Containerizer. The only missing piece uh, actually is the, the part of like provisioning a file system for a container. So essentially, uh, and also I think we realized that maintaining two containerizers is kind of painful. And uh, anytime you want to add a new feature, you have to do both implementations, which is hard to maintain uh, in the end. So uh, what we decide to do at the time is trying to uh, just adding this missing piece into Mesos Containerizer, what we call provisioners. So provisioner is an, uh, an, an yet another abstraction inside Mesos Containerizer to allow you to customize um, the file system provisioning part. So right now, there are like two implementations. There's a Docker image provisioner, and there's an AppC image provisioner. And we are adding OCI image support right now. I think the, the, the patch is in review. and needs to be merged uh, very soon. Um, so we also add some more isolators um, to, um, to kind of match the functionality from Docker. For example, the volume support, uh, like capability support, R limits, 
Uh, and also we've made this special uh, isolator for uh, interpreting like things like environment variable and entry point inside a Docker image. So that's 2016. Um, uh, and, and I think like uh, after that, I think we're uh, I think that the kind of the direction we take in that project in containerization is trying to adopt those new standards for containers. I think there's a lot of standard being made um, during that last year and the year before uh, last, uh, and, and, and we are trying to adopt those um, container standards. I think that like ma majorly three categories. I, I kind of category into three major category: container image, container network, and container storage. There might be more, but right now these are the major three area that people are making standard for. Uh, and I'm going to talk about each of those uh, in the next a few slides. And I think Mesos is going to support all these uh, through the pluggable interface inside Mesos Containerizer. So uh, if you're talking about container standard, effectively, like th there's only one standard right now, which is Docker. Um, and Docker has this um, registry API um, that um, there's a bunch of implementation of that registry API, like JFrog, Netflix, and uh, also those cloud providers have um, their registry being hosted, and also Docker Hub. Um, and then for storage, Docker has this volume plugin called Docker Volume Driver Interface, and there's a lot of implementation of that interface uh, uh, in the ecosystem, like uh, um, Poreworks, Rexray, ClusterFS, um, these kind of plugins. And then for networking, Docker used this um, interface called LibNetwork. Uh, it's a network model, they call. Um, and you can, using that network model to build your own plugins, and the major network vendors have the, the implementation there, like Calico, County, uh, Cisco, Juniper, these kind of companies. Um, but, but the fact that I think this is not a, a good ecosystem because it's centralized, uh, you know, it's kind of Docker-centric uh, thing. And uh, a, a true standard, I think, is uh, it, has to be, it has to have a stable interface. Uh, it has to have backwards cap compatibility guarantee. And, uh, and there has to be multiple implementation for a given standard uh, because I don't think that a single stand, I mean, I mean, we basically, we need to decouple the standard from the actual implementation. These are two different things. We should not couple them together. In the Docker case, actually, like implementation and a standard are actually coupled together, so which is not a good thing for the ecosystem. Uh, and also, it has to be vendor neutral. Ideally, like there are more vendors uh, in, in, in that ecosystem, the better. And also, you have to have that interoperability. So, when, like for example, if you build a plugin for one platform. Um, uh, according to one standard, it should be very easy to move that plugin to a different platform because they both implement the same standard. So the ideal world is like this. So that, that's the current situation. So the ideal world is like you replace Docker with a bunch of container orchestration systems and, uh, and then just replace those interfaces with a, a kind of a, a, a true container standard. For example, for the registry API, uh, it's container image spec. For, um, for volume plugging, it's container storage spec, and for networking, it's container network spec. So that's the ideal world. Uh, so we need a lot of standard for containers, image, networking, storage. That's what I mentioned. And you probably need some like runtime standard or, or metrics or some other monitoring standard for containers. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to just focus on these three, image, networking, and storage. Um, because I think there's not really a standard for our metrics yet, but there is a standard for runtime, but uh, it's not the focus of, of this talk. Um, so container image spec, what's the scope of that standard, basically? Uh, if you think about that, it's basically like application writers uh, run an application, they compile their applications, and then the next thing is they need to package their application into some sort of image. And then, and also package not just the, the application binary, and you also need to package those application configurations into the image. And then you uh, need to, uh, once you get the image, you have to um, store the image and transfer the image over the wire into um, the machine that you actually want to run the container in production. Uh, on, 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 the pr on the target machines, you have to uh, un unpack the image so that you can get those, you can recover those application binary and the config and then run those applications using those config. So that's, how, that's what an image span needs to do um, to me. I think there's already a standard for that, which is OCI, container, uh, Open Container Initiative. Um, so, uh, so Open Container Initiative has two spec right now. One is called image spec, the other one is called runtime spec. So this one I'm focusing on is the image spec because that's what developer cares about. Um, because uh, as long as you have an image spec you, and you guarantee that um, the way you uh, run your image on this machine is exactly the same as you run on the other machine, then it should be 
um, pretty straightforward. Um, you probably don't need other things. Uh, so Mesos will support OCI soon. Uh, I think the reason we don't merge that patch yet is because we want to um, do our due diligence to um, make sure that the way we store those layers and artifacts in a way that it's extensible in the future. Because if you think about that, it's not just simple as just store that on the file system. You have to, um, how do you index them? How do you do garbage collection? How do you do cache replacement? Things like this. And I don't want to introduce uh, too much complexity, like too much complexity uh, yet for another new uh, image format. I want to unify all these um, things into one single unified artifact store I'm going to mention later. Uh, so, that, so that's the only reason that we don't merge those patch yet, but I will, we will probably merge those patch very soon. Um, so, um, so Mesos, I, I already mentioned, Mesos Containerizer already support like Docker images, and we support AppC images. So in the future, it's very natural to just extend the provisioner interface to add a new store called OCI um, to, to support that. That will be very straightforward. Um, for networking, um, this, what a networking uh, specification needs to, to handle in the container world, I think the scope for that is uh, how, to, how do you connect containers? How do you allocate IP addresses? How do you enforce security policies, isolated performance, um, provide, a, provide QoS or, or balance network traffic? Uh, there's a, lot, a bunch of stuff you need to handle in networking area. Um, so there's a standard already right now, but I don't think it handles all these. I handle some of these, but not all of them. So we probably need some other standard, or like we improve that standard to handle all these networking stuff. So the CNI is that the, the standard right now, essentially adopted by major orchestration systems and network vendors. Uh, it's a simple CLI-based interface, um, and uh, uh, and the container orchestration system just invoke those CLI commands before the container starts or after the container terminates. Uh, and they recently just joined CNCF, so it's a CNCF project being donated to CNCF recently. Um, so this is like how briefly how CNI works. So um, the container runtime on the left uh, will basically, before containers start, it will try to f um, create a container network namespace first, and then call CNI plugin with that network namespace saying that, hey, CNI plugin, please add my at your container into, um, into at this container's network into um, the one that um, provided by the underlying network vendor. Uh, so that so the container orchestration system just call add the simple CLI command just add the network to the net, to the network namespace. And then once the container terminates, it just called delete, which is just detach the network from the network namespace. Uh, and, and the actual configuration for the network is passing to the plugin through arguments, command line arguments, and the environment variables. And the IP management is actually part of the plugin logic. So the plugin is responsible for allocating IP if, um, if the container don't have an IP yet. And the IPAM interface is also pluggable. So there's an interface for IPAM that um, there's some general IPAM, like for example, local host based or uh, 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 like a centralized ETC based, uh, SED based um, IPAM. You can reuse those IPAM because the interface is standard. Uh, Meso support CNI from 0.28. I think uh, it's 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 only uh, it's only supported inside Meso's containerizer. Uh, and if you want to use that, just do a dash dash isolation equals network slash CNI on the agent config on the agent flag. Then you will be able to use CNI networks pro um, provided by those network vendors. And but you also need to install those network plugins on your agent host to be able to leverage that. And the majority of the vendor network vendors already support CNI. Um, okay, so um, for storage, I don't want to talk too much here because there's another talk after this talking about specifically about the container storage interface. I just give you a brief overview of what storage, uh, what a storage spec needs to handle in the container world. Um, the scope is like you have to handle like things like provisioning and deprovisioning volumes, attach detach volumes, mount and mount volumes. Uh, things like create snapshot or restore snapshot, take backup, things like this. So I think that's what a container storage interface needs to handle. And there is a new interface um, called container storage interface. It's a joint work between um, Mesos, Kubernetes, Docker, and Cloud Foundry community uh, on this. Um, and the goal of CSI is actually like make make sure that the vendor just need to make one plugin, and that plugin will work for all the container orchestration systems. And uh, it supports all the features that I mentioned previously. And uh, I think one thing I want to highlight here is also needs to support both mount and block volumes, not just mount volumes, and also support block volume because we do see use cases where people want to use raw block devices for some data workload. 
Anyway, I don't, I don't want to jump into too much detail here. So there's a talk in, in after this uh, at 4, I think, uh, on this. So I'm going to skip this part. OK, so. Um, at 4.30. 430. 4.30, OK. So I think the 4.30 in the same room. So we're going to cover that in, in, in the next talk. Um, um, the, rest thing I, the next thing I want to talk about is some kind of the new features we built into Mesos uh, since last year um, um, that we are really proud of. Uh, I think if you listen to Ben's keynote this morning, he mentioned some of the, the nesting support, debugging support, uh, debugging support already. So I just want to dive into some of the details why we build this and how we build this and, and, uh, and come up with a demo. So uh, why nested container? Uh, so um, we, we discovered a bunch of patterns that are um, making nested container uh, necessary. Uh, so one pattern we discovered is the sidecar pattern, right? You have a, a server running, and then you, at the same time, you have to run a proxy uh, alongside in the same network namespace with that main process, um, providing some authentication, authorization support, things like this. Um, so this is the one thing. And then the life cycle of these two containers needs to be tied together so that either one con if one container dies in, in, in that whole container, like whole pod, then the, the entire um, the, the processes in that pod will be killed. So that's the sidecar pattern. The other pattern we discover is called transient container. So you have, say, you have Cassandra running, and then you have some some job you want to perform on that Cassandra on on node and uh, things like backup. Uh, you want to like periodically um, take a, a backup for your Cassandra data. Um, but, but you don't want to run the backup all the time. It's not a service. It's more like a transient job that you want to run. It's like, more like a cron job. But you want to access the, the state uh, inside the Cassandra container. So this is like the, called another pattern that we discovered called transient container. Um, there's another pattern that we also discovered. We, I call it like hierarchical container. Uh, why we need nested container. Uh, so kind of, kind of nested container can be helpful here is like say for example you want to run Kubernetes on top of Mesos and then Kubernetes has this pod concept and then um, if you think about in this case actually think about Kubernetes kubelet is at the top level container and then and then each pod inside the Kubernetes is uh, actually the level one nested container and then the container inside that pod is the level two nested container and nested under level one. So, um, so like we discovered a lot of use cases for nesting containers, so that's the reason we built it last year. Um, and uh, uh, so Mesos Container Writer does support nesting. Uh, it can be uh, more than one level, so depths can be greater than two. Uh, and you can do volume sharing between siblings. Um, and it's fully compatible with other features in Mesos Containerizer. Uh, so how it works is actually like we provide an API on the agent, allow executor or any process inside a container to um, invoke that API to create a nested container. In this case, let's say the executor container wants to create a, uh, a nested container called Nginx. It just talks to agent API, say launch, with a, a bunch of configuration of the container and a command. And, agent, and the containerizer will just be uh, responsible for launching that Nginx container, provision the file system for that Docker image, and then just launch it. And, uh, um, and I, as I mentioned, uh, we support more than one, more than two level of nesting. So uh, one thing we do leverage this feature is debugging. Uh, so the, the way we implement debugging support is actually like a, um, by invoking, by, by launching a, like a, a nested container underneath the container you want to debug. For example, in this case, you want to debug um, the Nginx container. You, you have some problem with that container. Uh, what we essentially do when you do a, a debugging is uh, we're launching a level three nested container and nested underneath the Nginx container. Um, and that container has access to the namespace of the Nginx container so that you can do, um, do all the debugging work you want to do. So that's how we support debugging. Um, yeah, so I, I think I just mentioned the debugging support. So basically, the, the debug, debugging support that we want to do is basically provide uh, equivalent of Docker exec and Docker attach. And, and, and you can do that remotely. So you don't have to be on the same machine to do Docker exec. You can do that from any machine as long as you're authorized. Um, and then it's fully integrated with the Mesos authorization authentication. Uh, and it's actually leveraged Mesos container, uh, nested container support, as I mentioned. So OK, so rather than saying anything more, I'll give you a quick demo on this. Um, OK, so let me do this. Uh, so I have a, so this is my Mac. So I have a virtual machine running. So I the front. Uh, did good enough. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm doing a live demo. So uh, I'm gonna start a Mesos master first. Is that big enough? 
Okay, so I'm starting a Mesos master, so uh, I just specify IP is a very standard way of starting Mesos master. So I'm going back to my browser just to check if the 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 cluster is running. So okay, let me do this. All right, so um, the master is running, so I'm now starting the agent. So uh, I have a tab open to just show you uh, what the um, Uh, yeah, I think I saved the the config the, the command somewhere. Okay. Okay. So that's the command. Um, I already started master. The agent is basically like uh, these are the flags I specify. So especially for the isolation flag, I specify a bunch of isolators like Docker runtime, file and Linux, volume, some volume isolators, capability and namespace pit, and and you specify where you want to store the Docker layers, um, because I don't want to use the Docker image. Um, and that's how I start the slay. So I'm gonna start the slay. I have command save somewhere. Okay. So I just start a slay. Okay, so I go back to the UI, do a fresh. So there should be an agent registered um, on my virtual machine. So let me go back. Now I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna use um, Mesos Execute to um, to launch a uh, task group. We call it task group. It's actually you can think of that as just pod. You have multiple containers running in the same um, executor, um, and uh, we have a config for that task group. Let me go to that config. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, the config of the task group. So basically it has two containers, one called producer. Um, what the, the producer does is basically like a, um, specify a bunch of resources. The command it, do, it does is like uh, it has a volume and it will constantly, like every second, it will touch a file in that volume using, using the current date. The, 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 name of the, vol the name of the file is the current date. So that's producing some file in the shared volume. And it actually using a, 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 a Docker image um, and has this volume. It's a shared volume. And then there's another container. Uh, it's running the same executor called consumer. Um, the consumer is actually doing one simple thing, which is just basically um, ls this volume, trying to find out the content in this volume. Uh, and it has the same share volume, so it was. So if that working properly, you will see um, the, the the file you produce by the the producer, um, and the consumer can see those files, and it's using a Docker container as well. So that's the the the, the configuration of the task group. So I'm going to just launch that. All right, so it's running. I'm going to go to the UI. Yeah, you can see like there are two tasks running, producer, consumer, um, and I can go to the sandbox of the um, producer, sorry, consumer, just to see if um, the, the STD out. So it's constantly printing those uh, files inside that share volume, so that's working. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I just launched a task. I mean, if you go browse the, the, the content in the sandbox, so if you go to execute, so okay, hold on, go, wait a second. If you go to, um, the Asecurus um, sandbox. So that's the Asecurus sandbox. You have a share volume here, and the share volume contains all these files that you just touched. Uh, and then uh, if you go to each task, you can see con like these are the sandbox for the consumer uh, and producer. And then go to there, you have the SCD out and SDVR. It's fully nested underneath the top level Asecurus. So it's in the nested container, and top level Asecurus is running in level one container, and then the container in underneath the, the container the, the actual task is running under nest two ne level two nested container, uh, and you can get the STD out and the STD area in the same way as before. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do here is say there's a problem with the consumer. I wanna debug that container. So what I'm gonna do is actually I'm switching back to my Mac. Um, so just to to show you that it's possible to um, do that on a remote machine for debugging. Um, so I'm using a, a, a CLI. Which is actually DCOS CLI, but um, but it's gonna uh, we're gonna add in Mesos CLI for that too, so that it works for vanilla Mesos. So the so DCOS CLI is basically just hitting Mesos endpoint to streaming those um, responses. Um, let's see if we can run this. So I think I already configured this. I do a DCOS task. 
sorry, task. It shows all the tasks currently running inside the cluster. You can see the consumer and producer here. Now say I'm going to do a debugging for that um, container. So I'm going to do the COS task uh, exec consumer. And I want to launch a shell. Oh, this doesn't work. I think I need to do um, dash ti. So dash t dash i means like it's interactive and using a terminal. OK, so now I'm entering that container. If you do an ls, you can see um, the volume. So if I see into volume, and you can see all these files in the shared volume. And you can also um, cat the stdl files. Um, and yeah, and I think terminal also works. VI also works. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of the debugging. So if you go to UI, what's interesting you can find out is if you go to UI, uh, and if you go to the consumer sandbox, uh, you can actually see a subdirectory being created, which is actually the nested container underneath that container. And then if you go to um, these containers to see um, the command, so you can actually see all the command that I kind of um, type previously. Um, so so, so the, all the command that you do uh, while you're debugging are actually also um, captured and saved in the, the sandbox of that nested container underneath the, the level one nested container. So that's how the whole thing works right now. Um, uh, and I'm glad that we do that in this way. It's more extensible. All right, so I think that's it for the demo. Let me go back to my talk. Right, so um, future roadmaps. I think that's pretty important. That I think we have a lot of things to do. Uh, I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, one thing we want to do is standalone mode. So uh, we got some feedback from folks that it would be nice that we can use the Mesos Containerizer without even using Mesos Master. Yes, we are adding that support right now, uh, and it will be available pretty soon, I would say in a month, um, that uh, you, can, you can just hit an agent API to launching a container uh, on the agent without even involving any offer cycle. And I think there's another isolator that's contributed by Apple folks, uh, which is called host port isolation. For those folks that want to run container on host network and then only isolate the container using ports, um, this will be super helpful because that kind of enforces which port that a container can use. So basically, any port that's not allocated to that container uh, will not be used by that container. So there's some kernel feature. Uh, so, 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 so the is, the is, what the isolator does is basically scan those uh, proc files to make sure that all the ports, this, the processes inside that container is listening on or using are not part, is, is part of the allocated resources. If not, then it will just fail that container. It's a very uh, good thing that Apple guys contribute. Uh, and that part is being merged already. So if you, you want to use um, the latest head, then you can, sh should be able to use that. But if not, wait for the next release. Um, so uh, Apple forces are also adding like PAM module support to uh, allow Mesos container to use any arbitrary PAM module. Uh, and then I, I mentioned earlier that we want to do this unified artif artifact store because uh, we have a lot of like artifact store and cache inside Mesos, like for example, Fetcher cache and you have Docker layers, and right now it's like all separate, uh, which, is, which is not a good thing because you have to re implement all these like cache replacement algorithm, garbage collection algorithm for those cache, which is not uh, an extensible model. So I want to move to a uh, unified artifact store and using content, address content addressable storage to make sure that uh, we don't have duplicates there. And then we have a unified way to do um, garbage collection uh, and uh, do cache replacement. Uh, and also, um, regarding security, we're going to add support for SecCom and SE Linux. And uh, another thing that we just got started doing discussion is, co is called VM support and user namespace. Um, so we are doing some research on VM support uh, trying to figure out what's the best way to do VM support because I do get some feedback from folks that people want to mix the workload, like run some as container, run some as virtual machine because the, the security model provided by container is not that secure because the kernel is still shared um, compared to virtual machine, which is more st strictly more secure than a container for the, those applications that have a um, sensitive data running inside VM, VM is sometimes more um, desirable than running in a container. Uh, and also user namespace. I think uh, Apple folks is trying to do the user namespace space support recently. So we just have the discussion, and they are starting to do some prototype. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a future roadmap. If you have anything, feel free to talk to me that you want us to work on. 
Um, so um, just give you a quick summary. So containerization in May, so it's, it's very stable. It's in production for years, and, uh, and we do have the option to allow you to not rely on Docker daemon if you don't want to. And uh, it's very pluggable and extensible. You can our arbitrary extension by writing an isolator or provisioner or launcher. Uh, and we also embracing all the container standard. We are embracing um, container networking interface, container storage interface, and open container initiative. Um, and we do have a containerization working group. So there's a regular meeting every two weeks at Thursday morning, 9, p 9 a.m. PST, Pacific time, US. Uh, we do have a Slack channel called um, Containerizer um, if you're interested in any of the things that uh, happen inside containerization part of the Mesos project. Feel free to join us, and, uh, and all the meetings are recorded. Uh, we have a pretty good audience uh, every time, and we have a pretty good agenda every time, too. So uh, if you're interested, you can join us. And all the notes and agenda are actually uh, in this link if you, you are interested. And also, this is uh, accessible in the Mesos GitHub uh, documentation website. OK, so I think that's it. Uh, I want to open the, the door for questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. I will ab abuse my role as a track lead and ask the first question. OK. So you've been working in containerization before Docker became a thing. Mm -hmm. So if I would ask you to name two or three reasons why container became so popular. Do not divide for developers, DevOps, programmers, cluster, cluster operators, but three to main reasons why containers as, as a concept became so popular. What would you say? Yeah, so um, i probably just name one. I think the major reason that people move to container world is um, because developers really like containers because now they have a standard way to package their applications. Just imagine before container, what's the way you package your applications? It's platform dependent. On CentOS or Red Hat, you use RPMs. Or on, on Ubuntu, you use Debian packages. On some, like, I don't know what's the package mechanism on Windows or on, on, on OS X. So before container came along, that there's no standard way to package the application and deliver the, the, the application to, dev, uh, to, to SREs. So I think that's the biggest thing that I like container is. Like so the app store. Simplify the developers to, to, to package their application and run them out their applications. I think that's the biggest win of container. OK, do we have other questions? One hand on the left. Um, it's, it's great to see you're building tools for debugging. Um, of course, like one of the big cells of Docker when you're on a host is being able to run things like Docker PS, um, Docker Kill, and the, all of the other like CLI that's exposed uh, with the API. Is there plans to build like uh, some equivalency uh, with the Mesos containerizer? So if I was on an agent, Yep. I could run the equivalent of, of Docker PS to see all of the running containers. So right now, in fact, we have operated API on the agent. If you have a, 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 a curl, you can just curl those endpoints to, to launch a container, kill a container, and then get all the containers running on the agent. But we don't build that CLI yet, but that's on the roadmap. We definitely want to build that CLI. I think that's a kind of the project I want to do for a long time. Just don't have the resource to do that. But, but that's something we want to do for a long time. We definitely want to do that. Uh, even without a CLI, you can still hit those agent endpoint operator APIs to, to, to do the things you want to do. In fact, all these debugging uh, uh, functionality like attach, exact, are all part of that API. So if, essentially, right now, you can just write a script using curl to do that, um, or write a simple Python script to do that. But we're going to build that. Uh, we will build a CLI for that. That's soon. great. So regarding CI, it's not just on the roadmap, it's on the works. So if you visit the Mesosphere booth, there is a guy with a long beard, Kevin Clues. He's the lead for this effort. Other questions? Here. Can you tell us uh, a bit more about the uh, VM support? VM support? Yeah, yeah, because the life cycle is quite different in a VM from a, a container. Right. 
Yeah, so uh, we just get the, so, so during the, the containerization working group every two weeks, we just get started uh, on at the background research, how we want to do the VM support inside Mesos. And we start this doc trying to collect all, like, how other people are doing VM support uh, in, in their systems. Uh, I think we don't have a kind of the, the design doc yet, but I think um, one way to do that is support KVM. Because essentially KVM just a Linux process, you can and you can use C groups to to manage the resource isolation for that. But there's some other like thinking on that too. I just want to do all the research first before we moving forward. Um, but we do see a lot of kind of use cases for that. I think that's kind of important. That's the next thing we want to do as a group, containerization working group, and a lot of people are interested in that. If you're interested, you can participate in the working group too. There's a doc we are trying to fill out all these background research. For example, how Kubernetes is doing VM support, how uh, how OpenStack is doing VM support, how um, how K KVM is doing. I'm mean, someone mentioned Hyper, and also um, there's some um, and there's some Windows people. Like Windows has virtual machine support for their Windows containers, like things like that. We just do want to do all these research first before we move into a design. So that we are in that researching phase still, and we're gonna have a sync. Uh, in, in, in two weeks uh, on that, because last time we checked is like a month ago that we asked folks to do research themselves and then go back together to have a kind of a, a sync up in the working group meeting so that we can present each systems and then we decide what to do next. Make sense? More questions? Okay, what about <coughs> cleaning up of uh, like images that was created by UCR? Is there plans to create some tooling around that? Wait, so, and can you repeat the question? Uh, so, so when you create an image in, in, in Docker, so there, after some time, there are a lot of like stale images that you don't need, uh -huh. and they invented like some prop. Yeah. So okay. Tooling to, to clean them up. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is actually being worked on right now. So I think there are patches contributed by Ubers uh, on that because they want to run um, Mesos Containerizer in, in production, and that that's one thing they want to fix, which is like GC those image layers that's not being used. So we are adding an endpoint on the agent, trying allowing to prune images. And there's some more features uh, on that. There's actually a design doc somewhere uh, in the mailing list um, that basically we're adding this endpoint, allow you the operator to monitor the disk reusage. If that reaches a certain limit, you can hit that endpoint to just say, hey, prune all the unused images. It's not a simple problem because you, it's, you think about garbage collection, right? Like people are doing garbage collection for years. It's not a well solved research problem yet. Think about Java garbage collection, right? You have to do either mark and sweep or reference counting, things like this. But we are adding this endpoint right now, so it will be ready soon. And the initial algorithm we use is mark and sweep to just mark all the used layer, layers and then delete all these unused layers and then make some exception for uh, things like, uh, I think Uber has this use case where um, you don't want to delete some base images when you do a prune. So we're adding those filters too so that uh, it, it will be ready in 1.5, 1 1 .5, next release. Cool. If you promise that it will be in 1.5. More questions? Okay, looks like there are no more online questions. If you have questions later, I will try to spend the next day at the booth and uh, you can always shoot us an email. And uh, we are going for a break and the next talk will be at 16.30 here. It's about the container storage initiative. Have a good break and see you afterwards. <laughs>